welcome to yet another recall session now we are having quite a few sessions back to back we did do a neat medicine recall in march followed by a few clinical aid sessions and now we are back with ini recall for may 2023 so this is a very special very special kind of an exam primarily because of a few reasons which we will discuss in due course this INI exam, May 2023 exam, was supposedly a kind of a, what do you say, a last chance for many of the students who probably didn't do well in NEET and probably thought of clinging on to this opportunity because you're having a NEET exam now only after a few months. So, been already preparing so much, so why not try INI and INI just give me a very reasonable chance. This was the thought process and if you remember, I have actually done a recall session of INI in uh, 2022 wherein i had shown a penalty corner conversion no because INI had become so predictable it was like INI used to be the predictable exam wherein you knew that okay this would come that would come and there were so many people doing videos on youtube telling the importance about pyqs knowing pyqs will actually seal it for you concepts are not that much necessary and even i was in actually accordance with that because that was how INI was that is primarily because I think INA has three centers, PGI, AIMS and JIPMER and AIMS is an exam previously also when we had separate exams, very predictable. But this time INA comes in with a lot of surprises. It's a very different kind of an INA exam that you've had. It has springed in surprises, uh, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, if you just start naming the surprises, there are so many of them. So it was an exam that has uh, sprung in a lot of surprises, just like the rains that we have in summer. So summer rains are again, not at all common to have so whenever you have rains in some of those that bring happiness to few of us some of the people are very happy in seeing rains as i am some of the people are averse to rains but being uh, from the southern part of the country i think it's very common to be in sync with rains because you're very much uh, part and parcel as far as rains are concerned and monsoon is something that we are always looking for so uh, this time around we are having few unexpected showers in may here and there and the exam was also pretty much along the same lines we had few unexpected questions, really tough questions. And for the first time, I'm admitting that a paper is originally tough. I'm a person who definitely uh, would love to say that exam is okay, average, moderate, etc., etc., because I never feel something is really tough. But this time around, uh, I definitely have to confess the fact that exam was tough. There are so many questions which are probably a postgraduate level. There are questions which even postgraduates would find difficult to answer. So from an undergrad viewpoint, to actually take it, an answer is not going to be easy. And that really doesn't matter because for all of us, it is the same. So as far as the competitive exam is concerned, degree of difficulty is just a myth. I have never believed that degree of difficulty is important because even if it is easy, it's the same level of competition. Even if it is difficult, it is the same level of competition. But as the exam gets more and more difficult, people who are sound with respect to their base and people who are having rooted ideas, people who are having concrete blocks built in the beginning, they are the ones who are going to come trumps up. And as the exam gets easier and easier, then the game becomes more open and open. Like if you have a 50 over match between India and the West Indies, India definitely going to beat the West Indies. But if you have a 20 over match between India and the West Indies, then of course it's a 50-50. Even West Indies can win, even India can win. But if it's a 5 over match, then of course, then, then it, anybody can win, anything can happen. So that's how it is. So as the game gets more and more tougher, if it's a test match between India and the West Indies, definitely India will win. So the same theory applies here also. So we are expecting the one suits. And the monsoons is, uh, I mean, probably what we are expecting in a month or two. So, like in your case also, when you have proper rainfall, I think you'll just start sinking into that. Now, when you're having intermittent showers, of course, some people may like, some people may not like. So, that's how this exam was full of surprises. Let us start looking into the questions without wasting time. But before we just start off with the questions, it's kind of a few points that I want to reiterate. Again, if you agree with that, perfectly fine. Even if you don't agree with that, you don't have to agree. The first is... That we are having three different institutes here okay so this you have to agree because it's a fact we have pgi we have aims and we have jipmer and people who have studied there or people who have been there would know that these three these three institutes although called as the premier three institutes in the country i think alongside with cmc stbj etc have very different working patterns have different nature and different nature of work so that nature of work is so strikingly different between these three centers and the way the department functions in these three centers is also very different that when they set out to set when they set out to actually put a question paper for your INI, depending on who is going to actually set the paper, the paper is going to be strikingly different. That's why the paper will definitely keep changing colors from time to time. 
Even when we were writing Kenwood's exam, AIMS exam was totally different from PGA, was totally different from JIPMER. If you look at the AIMS exam, AIMS is an exam which was centered on PYQs. 75 to 80% of the questions would be repeat. 75 to 80% would be repeat. The rest of the questions would be on topics which were already asked. You know, okay, a question from this will come, a question from this will come. So you it is so much a predictable exam. And when predictability comes in, the problem is people start taking shortcuts. Shortcuts and strategies are totally different. Never ever think that a shortcut is equal to a strategy. Shortcut is different, strategy is different. As I have said so many times, as my parents have taught me and as our seniors have taught us, Perpendicular distance is always the shortest distance. There's absolutely no doubt in that. So never go for shortcuts. Never go for oblique paths. Please go with a straight path. Strategy is what we have to be talking about. And I'm a person who believes very strongly in strategizing. As you would have discussed from, you would have understood from my videos. I keep on devising strategies. Everything I try to strategize. But strategization is not equal to taking shortcuts. So there are three centers who would conduct exam at completely three different levels. For example, if AIMS is conducting the exam, that would be the path. And it would be very easy. JIPMER is a center focusing on real depth the knowledge that means they want to get into the thick of things understand this way exactly how it is and critically analyze critically analyze theoretical points and they would even ask things which are basically not so much important for an undergraduate i remember during our times when we had the zipmer exams they used to ask us things like uh, which were completely out of the box like flat brush diabetes flat brush diabetes is something what is that diabetes nobody really knew when you saw the paper flat brush diabetes flat brush is a province in uh, us which was near new york and that's where the first case of ketosis prone diabetes was identified so it was called as flat brush diabetes they asked us about hephresia that is a kind of an inhalational insulin so it's just a trade name and even that was asked so they used to ask such kind of questions so it's it's very common for jipman to ask such kind of questions pgi focuses on your real skill of whether you know the topic properly it may be a common topic but they would get in to that point where uh, even if you know the topic if you've read the topic you'll still start getting confused so it's like a uh, core 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 clinical analysis of how how well you do of how much you you know also so these three exams are totally different so because there are three institutes and the exam can be put by any of them so they it just keeps changing colors so there is no point in thinking that ini is going to be this way that's what this exam has taught us pyq's boon or curse is a definite question but you can't get away without knowing pyq so there is no harm in studying pyq's we have to study pyq's at least the last three four years pyq's we should be knowing for neat i don't think it makes sense but i know you have to be knowing but thinking that okay pyq is the way forward and understanding and studying from pyq's is a big big blunder knowing concepts knowing strongly what is what is essentially the only route to success linking that integrating that is our skill and pyqs can be actually used as a mode to test out again as to whether we understood things in the right way and of course studying pyqs is mandatory but not be sitting uh, with pyqs all the time and thinking that uh, essentially we are maybe crossing the bar many a times and the classes are crossing the bar and i have to be happy with pyqs and i have to stay average as i said if you're planning to stay average you better leave this and go as far as medicine is concerned there is no point in staying average because every patient is somebody else's brother or sister so we have no business staying average here either we do our job or we just get away from here so the point is we have to again up our bar up our bar up our bar so that we do justice to the people who come in front of us and that is basically what our profession is things getting too predictable yeah that is what i was uh, figuring out last april and may when we we're seeing students preparing for ini they were not interested in learning anything per se they were just keeping on solving pyqs pyqs and just mugging up that that is definitely not the way forward we we have to have a balance i'm also a person who strongly believes in mugging up i know the value of mugging up indian system exam is something where when you mug up effectively then you become a topper that is the difference between me getting 524 for pg and rank one for dm that is primarily because i didn't know this mug up thing so well or i knew but i didn't i mean execute it properly during my pg time but for dm exam i was very very clear with the strategy of mugging up so that's of course there but just mugging up is not the way forward and definitely comparisons that means half the time we lose on making comparisons between this uh, platform that platform this faculty that faculty this mode of preparation that mode of preparation this notes that notes etc primarily please stick on to one platform please have a liking for the person who's taking class for you if you're not comfortable with him if you don't like seeing him switch over to another person but stick on to one single person and stick on to his way of teaching or stick on to one source for learning please keeping I mean, again and again, switching over, switching over between different, different platforms, different, different teachers, different, different concepts can actually make uh, learning a very terrible business and you may actually lose the basic interest that you have. So it's prime of issue, very, very important because the way a person actually delivers is, is very unique. 
for example dr abek or abek madam is somebody who i know very personally also she has a very unique way of rendering biochemistry is the same we have only the same harper but you cannot find her way of rendering similar to anybody else you see i'm not saying that is superior or this is superior or nothing like it's not a comparison thing but her way of rendering especially genetics is very unique so if you follow that you get some kind of a confidence because that is very strong material but if you try to club it with something else or try to compare it with something else then suddenly you may lose this confidence okay suddenly you may lose this confidence because you may see somebody rending on a different note on a different level so that may actually make you think as whether i have to go this way that way etc so please stick on to one platform stick on to one teacher stick on to one resource and uh, and trust it to the maximum and give your full on that's basically the way to go so let's get on with things starting with rheumatology immunology this time whenever i teach rheumatology immunology of course there is a, there are like few thoughts there are few people who have even uh, said ki oh me learning this is very difficult etc again and again i'm telling you me teaching rheumatology immunology uh, in some depth is primarily because of two reasons one reason is when the exam gets tough this is what is going to get tough because to put a clinical degradation question for anyone in the world easiest is to put in rheumatology immunology second major reason is many of the students across the country have absolutely no exposure which is the speciality where they have zero exposure is basically rheumatology immunology still remember a student at the end of a class in chennai coming and telling me that he felt so happy that he understood that there are so many topics in that rheumatology till that day he was thinking that rheumatology is a department which treats rheumatoid arthritis and suddenly he has understood that there are an umbrella of diseases that you are having right under the umbrella you are having a spectrum of diseases so that's what made him happy so that is the main reason i want people to at least be aware that we are having a big up and running speciality like this and this time around the so called tough questions were definitely from this we'll just try to see uh, again i'm telling you that many of the questions were tough but it applies to everyone and let's see how we can tackle that see question number 1 so 35 year old female presents with skin thickening muscle weakness and her peripheries become pale on exposure to cold this is the closest to the original question that i could ana positivity was given is what students say creatinine kinase increased was also given anti scl antibody positivity was also given perifascular infiltration noted on biopsy was also given so so many so many details were actually given with the question and they have asked you to figure out the antibody so antibody questions are very 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 common and you know that you have to know everything with respect to antibodies as far as rheumatology is concerned match the following questions this that type of questions everything can come so let us try to critically analyze this if i were a student how would i have a thought of this question now whenever i see this pale on exposure to cold and i will write it as raynaud's phenomenon correct i will write it as raynaud's phenomenon once i write it as rp okay let's try looking at the question in different different ways we'll come to the same answer rp means what are the causes of rp okay what are the causes of rp scleroderma is the main cause for rp yes scleroderma is the main cause for rp scleroderma is better called as systemic sclerosis because we don't use localized scleroderma under medicine that is coming under dermatology so systemic sclerosis systemic sclerosis has two parts we can either have diffuse systemic sclerosis or we can have limited systemic sclerosis so we have diffuse systemic sclerosis limited systemic sclerosis in that we have studied very very clearly that severe raynaud's long standing raynaud's is seen in limited systemic sclerosis so severe raynaud's long standing raynaud is seen in limited systemic sclerosis diffuse systemic sclerosis does not have such severe long standing raynaud's more short standing raynaud okay but even if you don't know that just keep it like second option for raynaud's phenomenon is your mixed connective tissue disease whenever you think of raynaud's phenomenon the second thing that comes to your mind is mctd mctd is identified by we will come to that but the most important part of mctd that you have to be knowing is mctd is 90% presenting to us with raynaud's phenomenon okay along with raynaud's phenomenon we also know that there is arthritis there is myositis there is puffy hand and sclerodactyly so sclerodactyly arthritis myositis puffy hand is raynaud's is mctd mixed connective tissue disease and 90% of the time it is raynaud's in mctd in mctd there are two additional points that we have always always focused on one is that ana will be positive in 100% of patients second one is that you will be having an antibody called as anti u1 rnp so anti u1 rnp is the antibody for mctd ANA is positive in 100% of patients there are only three conditions of rheumatology where ANA is positive in everyone one is drug induced lupus erythematosus second is autoimmune hepatitis type 1 and third is MCD this we have discussed so many times so ANA 100% anti u1 rnp then these set of findings are MCD MCD can also have raynaud correct third one is what we call as anti jo syndrome an antibody against jo1 that is also called anti synthetase syndrome correct 
so anti jo1 that is called anti synthetic syndrome anti synthetic syndrome is seen in association with polymyositis and dermatomyositis correct anti synthetic syndrome is seen in association with polymyositis and dermatomyositis where the patient has classically mechanics hand yes mechanics hand is the classical thing with raynaud's phenomenon with arthritis and ild so mechanics hand raynaud's phenomenon arthritis ild this is what is called anti jo1 or anti synthetic syndrome that also we have seen few patients with jogren syndrome can also have rp as the presentation so when you think of rp or raynaud's phenomenon what we are talking of is secondary raynaud's phenomenon here that means it is not primary primary is different secondary raynaud's phenomenon is what we are talking of prime because this is ana positive we don't even have to think of primary scleroderma mctd anti jo1 jogren and primary will be seen in a very young girl also and other features won't be there positive family history mild raynaud that is primary raynaud's phenomenon that's called raynaud's disease that is not what we are discussing we are discussing secondary raynaud's so there are four options which can be correct if you look at the question that way nothing about jogren is actually given here nothing about jogren is given here so you basically can actually rule out jogren correct mctd we will keep in mind but again nothing much suggestive of mctd but we will keep mctd in mind anti jo1 we can keep in mind scleroderma we can keep in mind but a very very important thing that they have given is the patient is anti scl70 positive anti scl70 positive and they have also given that there is skin thickening so when there is anti scl70 positivity and skin thickening what is anti scl70 equal to anti anti scl70 is called as our anti topo isomerase 1 antibody okay anti scl70 is equal to our anti topo isomerase 1 antibody which is seen in diffuse systemic sclerosis Correct. So, anti-SCL70 is equal to anti-topoisomerase 1 antibody, which you see in diffuse systemic sclerosis. So, which actually means that they have told you cut and clear that this is diffuse systemic sclerosis. If anti-SCL70 was not given, still they say they have given skin thickening, which again means a systemic sclerosis. You can't say diffuse, but here because anti-SCL70 is given, you can say diffuse systemic sclerosis. There are only three specific antibodies in this condition called scleroderma. One is anti-SCL70, second one is anti-syndromia antibody which you see in limited okay anti syndrome antibody which you see in limited and then you have anti rna polymerase 3 anti rna polymerase 3 which you again see in diffuse so we have anti syndrome antibody in limited anti rna polymerase 3 in diffuse and anti scl70 that is in diffuse so they have actually given that there is already diffuse which means that right now we have just tried to come to our diagnosis very easily we have a middle aged female correct we have a middle aged female in this middle aged female we are having scleroderma like features yes there is scleroderma like features scleroderma like features is identified by the fact that she has skin thickening it is also identified by the fact that she has scl70 positivity and also identified by the fact that she has rp so three very very important things and ana is also positive so ana is positive rp is there skin thickening is there scl70 is there this scleroderma i will write as diffuse systemic sclerosis because that is the better answer scl70 is positive now on top of this I have to add something. I have to add something. What is that? She has muscle weakness. So, there is myositis. Correct? There is myositis. This myositis is creatinine kinase positive. So, creatinine kinase positive and the patient has perifesicular atrophy. Perifesicular atrophy. So, whenever you are having with the systemic sclerosis or muscle kind of a disease, you obviously have to think of inflammatory muscle disorder in inflammatory muscle disorder when you hear this word called perifesicular infiltration perifesicular involvement involvement we have always always told that that is equal to dermatomyositis so perifesicular involvement in the inflammatory muscle disease inflammatory muscle disease means mostly polymyositis dermatomyositis others are also there but mostly it is polymyositis dermatomyositis here perifesicular atrophy and perifesicular infiltration is seen with dermatomyositis so the patient has dermatomyositis you can say almost but it can even be polymyositis because perifesicular atrophy is classical of dermatomyositis infiltration perivesicular can be seen in polymyositis also but even you don't know that that's fine so perifesicular atrophy or infiltration or whatever and there is a muscle disease which can be polymyositis dermatomyositis okay so what do you now know this patient has systemic sclerosis which is mostly diffuse systemic sclerosis plus inflammatory muscle disease inflammatory muscle disease can be mostly dermatomyositis or sometimes can be polymyositis also so there is a patient who has systemic sclerosis and inflammatory muscle disease correct can it be anti-nuclear antibody that is already given right so i don't know whether it is the right option but it's a totally crazy option because already given an is positive what's the point in this anti jo antibody is for anti-synthetic syndrome anti-synthetic syndrome means they would have given you what they would have given you mechanics can't that means crusting hyperkeratotic scaly lesions on the lateral aspect or radial aspect of the index finger middle finger that's not been given 
anti jovan means they would have given you arthritis anti jovan means they would have given you ild so definitely not anti syndromere antibody is equal to crest syndrome so here limited systemic sclerosis okay, with raynaud's you can think but nothing like crest is given crest means what calcinosis cutis would have been given esophagitis should have been given sclerodactyly should have been given telangiectasia should have been given here you have not got anything with respect to that so marking it as anti syndromere antibody also is not right whereas we are now going to this antibody which is anti pm scl70 antibody which is so very classical and we have discussed that anti pm scl70 is a kind of an antibody which you see in overlap syndrome what is the meaning of overlap syndrome there can be different different types of overlap if you remember we have discussed that very very specifically what is the meaning of the term called overlap syndrome patient can have sle systemic sclerosis polymyositis dermatomyositis rheumatoid arthritis and Jogren syndrome. If you look at this, how many diseases are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Out of this, when you are having feature of more than one out of the six diseases, when you are having features of more than one out of the six diseases, then it is called as overlap syndrome. So then it is called as overlap syndrome. And you know that MCT is a type of overlap, which we will again see. So out of these six diseases, when you are having features suggestive of more than one connective tissue disease, then it is called as overlap. You can have a silly joker and overlap, systemic sclerosis, joker and overlap, polymycetic systemic sclerosis, overlap. Any kind of overlap is possible. And generally in overlap, the most common disease that you encounter is a Jogren syndrome. So the common disease that you encounter is a Jogren syndrome. And MCTD is a specific type of overlap. What is MCTD? MCTD is a specific type of overlap where you are having anti one rnp positive. So, overlap with anti one rnp positive can be considered as MCTD. MCTD is a specific type of overlap. Otherwise, what we are looking for is just overlap. And overlap can have anything out of this. And this particular case, what do you feel? It is a polymyositis bar dermatomyositis with the systemic sclerosis overlap. So, it is a polymyositis bar dermatomyositis with the systemic sclerosis overlap. And there the classical antibodies, anti PM, SCL antibody. So, anti PM SCL antibody. So, definitely tough question. Definitely tough question. But if you know your rheumatology properly, if you know your rheumatology uh, well, then I think you will answer. If you don't know your rheumatology properly, you will not answer. It is as simple as that. Okay. So, this is one way of looking at the question. Second way of looking at the question is that you know that there is skin thickening. You know that there is exposure to cold issues. You write it straight away as RP. And in RP, you know that there is systemic sclerosis. Then you know that there is muscle weakness. So, you put it as polymyositis or dermatomyositis. Both these together means the antibody in overlap is PMSCL70 antibody. That way, without knowing much also, you can come to the answer. But if you think that it is a very tough question, then there is no way forward. But many people have answered this question correctly. Meaning that the only option for us is to up our bar and try and come to a point where we can answer this question. What else can I say? Let me just try to uh, make the key points very clear. We have systemic sclerosis specific antibodies. Okay, systemic sclerosis specific antibodies. And we have systemic sclerosis associated antibodies. So, systemic sclerosis associated antibodies. Associated antibodies means they are mostly part of this overlap syndrome. Mostly part of this overlap syndrome. Systemic sclerosis specific antibodies means we have three specific antibodies for systemic sclerosis. Overlap associated antibodies means we have two associated antibodies. The three specific antibodies are anti SCL70, which is otherwise called as anti topoisomerase 1 antibody. So, anti SCL70, otherwise called anti topoisomerase 1 antibody. Then we have anti syndromere antibody, anti syndromere antibody. Then we have anti RNA polymerase 3 antibody. So, anti syndromere antibody anti RNA polymerase 3 antibody. These are the three specific antibodies. The associated antibodies which you can see as a part of overlap syndrome include anti PM SCL antibody okay, and anti Q antibody. So, anti PM SCL antibody and anti Q antibody. Correct. So, specific antibodies include anti SCL70 antibody, anti syndromere antibody, anti RNA polymerase 3 antibody. The associated antibodies include anti PM SCL antibody, anti Q antibody. Clear. Now, let us see the cardinal points. First is anti-SCL70 antibody. When you look at anti-SCL70 antibody, it's a specific antibody for diffuse systemic sclerosis. What are the associated findings that you are expecting to get? All features of diffuse systemic sclerosis, that is your skin thickening and fibrosis. Okay, skin thickening and fibrosis. Second is classical tendon friction rubs. On passive movement of the joint, you can actually see this tendon friction rubs. Third is cardiac involvement. Four is renal involvement, which we call scleroderma renal crisis. 
and the chance to go into interstitial lung disease which is the major complication so all these things that you see with diffuse in limited we don't see tendon friction rubs in limited we don't see so much of cardiac in limited we don't see so much of renal in limited we don't see ild it's ph that predominates so this is what is anti sl70 all these points are very very important correct when you go to the second antibody that is anti centromere antibody anti centromere antibody is seen in limited and is associated with this crest syndrome so where c stands for calcinosis cutis r stands for enox phenomena e stands for esophagitis s stands for sclerodactyly t stands for telangiectasia so it's not fibrosis that actually predominates it is telangiectasia that predominates and seeing telangiectasia mean that of course there is high chance for ph which is the major complication r is standing for raynaud's phenomenon and raynaud's phenomenon is actually speaking a severe form of raynaud's phenomenon here so severe raynaud's calcinosis cutis esophagitis sclerodactyly telangiectasia going in for ph this is what we see with anti syndromere what we call as the crest syndrome and always remember cardiac involvement renal involvement tendon rubs these are all not seen with anti syndromere so cardiac involvement renal involvement tendon rubs and ild these are actually not seen with limited in limited the major complication that you are expecting is pulmonary artery hypertension okay the third antibody that you have to study is anti rna polymerase 3 anti rna polymerase 3 first point is also seen in diffuse systemic sclerosis okay major point is very rapidly progressive disease rapidly progressive disease with ulceration especially skin ulcers okay ulceration very commonly asked for the exam second is the association with malignancy you may see malignancy at that time you may see malignancy later on etc etc third point is the association with gave that is gastric antral vascular ectasia which you study in surgery with the typical watermelon stomach and all that and number four is renal involvement five going in for joint contractors so rapidly progressive skin involvement with ulceration malignancy gave renal and joint contractors this is what is called anti rna polymerase 3 and now we have an update that anti rna polymerase 3 is the most specific antibody for sclerodoma and renal crisis previously it was u3 rnp now it is anti rna polymerase 3 so diffuse systemic sclerosis set of points to study limited systemic sclerosis set of antibodies and antibody and set of points to study rna polymerase 3 again these are the points to study these are the three specific antibodies when you are looking for associated antibodies we have anti pm scl antibody and anti ku antibody both are characterized by systemic sclerosis with polymyositis or dermatomyositis overlap and in both the cases the risk is that it can go into ild okay so systemic sclerosis with polymyositis dermatomyositis overlap is what we call anti pmscl or anti ku both are actually same but both of them are having risk for going into ild of which anti ku has actually got more risk of going into ild pmscl doesn't have that much risk of going into ild that you need not know so these many things are actually there in that question hopefully even if you don't know these many things if you know the basic approach to antibody in uh, rheumatology you'll be able to answer that but i definitely accept that it is a tough question but having having come across this question it becomes a responsibility to discuss okay because we discussed antibodies over here i just want you to keep in mind the antibodies that you see in muscle disease also one antibody i already told you which is called your anti jo antibody anti jo antibody is equal to your anti synthetase that is the same an anti synthetase antibody is characterized by four findings and those four findings i have already told you rp is one finding mechanic scan is another finding arthritis is another finding ild is another finding these are the four things that you can see with anti jo antibody along with this there are a set of antibodies to study in polymyositis dermatomyositis cardinal points i have told you please please don't miss that anti nxp2 and anti tif1 gamma okay anti nxp2 anti tif1 gamma they are very very important because they can be seen in juvenile dermatomyositis and they can be part of paraneoplastic also so paraneoplastic or malignancy associated and juvenile dermatomyositis you have two very important antibodies to study that is nxp2 and tif1 gamma so please please do keep that in mind another one that i want you to specifically remember is anti mda5 melanoma differentiation associated protein 5 anti mda5 and there is another antibody called SAE small ubiquitin activated enzyme that you need not know MDA5 is what you have to remember these two antibodies are associated with what is called amyopathic dermatomyositis amyopathic dermatomyositis means there is no muscle involvement only skin involvement but in spite of the fact that there is only skin involvement it has a very rapid course okay 
where you have so many ischemic ulcers and it has a risk of going into ILD. So, amyopathic dermatomyositis with a rapid course ulceration and very high chance of going into ILD is this anti MDA5. Okay. So, please try to keep MDA5 in mind. Please try to keep NXP2 and different gamma in mind. Okay. And last one is immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. In immune mediated necrotizing myopathy, which is generally asked in pharmac, what is the question that you get there? It is associated with statin use and in some people who take statin, there can be immune mediated necrotizing myopathy. What is the antibody that you give? Anti, what is the antibody that you get? Anti-HMG coenzyme A reductase antibody. Okay. Which is characterized by severe disease. Severe acute disease. Okay. Severe acute disease with necrotizing myopathy. Severe acute disease with necrotizing myopathy where you have to go for intense immunosuppression. Okay, so that's it. So, you basically have to keep all these antibodies in mind, uh, not to that much level, but at least the basic things so that you are able to eliminate and come to the answer. So, on the whole, please try to keep the three specific antibodies for scleroderma in mind that is diffuse SCL70 limited centromere again in diffuse RNA polymerase 3. The overlap antibodies PMSCL and CO antibody. Myositis antibody is the most important one, anti jo or anti synthesis antibody, and the associated other antibodies include and the other antibodies include. NXP2 tif one gamma, also try to keep MDA5 in mind and the HMG coenzyme reductase in mind. Okay, so we go to question number two. Question number two is again terribly tough question. Terribly tough question which I have actually discussed in super specialty section on the marrow up. So you can imagine how difficult that is. It's a PG level understanding thing, but pathologist also will actually try to help you answer this. But it's seen in one of the marrow question pearls, you can see this. That is to identify the type of staining. Looking at this to identify the type of staining, if you can do, you can directly become a rheumatology immunology PG. I started learning this only when I was in final year of my DM that I had some kind of an idea as to how to identify this. So that is very, very tough. So knowing that this is very, very tough, let us try to develop a very basic understanding of this. If you get an image like this, what do you actually look for? So as far as nuclear patterns are concerned, okay, as far as nuclear patterns are concerned, uh, to identify patterns for your exam, only four patterns can be asked. One is called homogeneous pattern. Second is called dense fine speckled pattern. Third is called fine speckled pattern. And fourth is called coarse speckled pattern. Other patterns are beyond the scope of discussion as far as nuclear patterns are concerned. Then there is a nucleolar and cytoplasmic pattern which we are not discussing. So ideally for your exam at least you must be knowing four patterns. One is homogeneous pattern, dense fine speckled pattern, fine speckled pattern, coarse fine speckled, uh, sorry coarse speckled pattern, four patterns. Now let us see the first pattern. This is the first pattern. What is this pattern? So, you can see that all the cells are here, see uniformly homogeneously stained. So, this is like homogeneous staining, correct? Homogeneous staining is what is this? So, this is looking like homogeneous staining. And at the same time, the mitotic cell is very strongly stained. So, mitotic cell is very strongly positive. You can see the mitotic cell is very strongly positive and the rest of the cells are uniformly homogeneously stained. This is called the homogeneous pattern. So, definitely this image is not equal to homogeneous pattern. You know that. This is a homogeneous pattern perfect where the mitotic cell is also strongly stained. So, you can actually see homogeneous appearance and mitotic cells have very, very, very strong staining. Correct. So, the theory question that you should be knowing, this is called the first pattern. The theory question that you should be knowing is where will you see homogeneous pattern? Homogeneous pattern can be seen with anti DS DNA. Homogeneous pattern can be seen with anti histone. Homogeneous pattern can be seen in JIA. And homogeneous pattern can be seen in autoimmune hepatitis. So, anti DS DNA can have a homogeneous pattern. Anti histone means drug induced lupus. There also you can have a homogeneous pattern. JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, you can have a homogeneous pattern. And autoimmune hepatitis, you can have a homogeneous pattern. Of which anti DS DNA and anti histone are the two theory questions that have been asked from here. But nobody is asked to identify a homogeneous pattern. Correct. This is homogeneous pattern. Let us look into the second pattern. Second pattern also, you see that this mitotic cell is very strongly stained. Mitotic cell is very, very strongly stained. You can see mitotic cell. Mitotic cell is very coarse, strongly stained. The rest of the cells, you know, is not a homogeneous pattern, correct? It is not a homogeneous pattern. You have pattern inside which there are so many different size and shapes. Like see, some size, some shape, so how many different size and shape. So essentially, how do you identify the second pattern? Second pattern means that heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is the most important part. Second is that again, mitotic cells are very strongly stained. 
Correct. So let us just come back to this. Here, all the cells are homogeneously stained. Mitotic cell is strongly stained. Here, all the cells are stained with different different speckles of different different size and shape. Different size and shape speckles. And out of these different size and shape speckles, the mitotic cell is also stained. This is called dense fine speckled pattern. Okay, DFS pattern or dense fine speckled pattern. In this dense fine speckled pattern, okay, this dense fine speckled pattern rules out a CTD. So, whenever you are having dense fine speckle, it rules out CTD. Not fine speckled, I am saying dense fine speckle, okay. Dense fine speckle rules out a CTD. You can actually see dense fine speckled pattern, speckling with characteristic heterogeneity and the mitotic cell is very, very strongly positive. Okay, fine. Let us go to the third pattern now. The third pattern is this one, correct. When you look at this pattern, okay, when you look at this pattern, you have to be thinking of centromere. Let us see how. Mitotic cell is very strongly stained. Yes, mitotic cell is very strongly stained. The other cells are also very, very, very strongly stained. Yes, you can see very bright, bright, bright. And the key point of difference that you are actually going to notice that you are going to see coarse speckles. You are going to see uniform coarse speckles. Uniform, 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 uniform coarse speckles, which are actually speaking very bright. See, uniform coarse speckles, which are very, very bright. For example, if you say this is a fine speckle, this is more of a coarse speckle. See, if I am having to draw, this would be my dense fine speckled pattern, which means some are fine, some are coarse. And the mitotic cell will be very, very strongly positive. If I take up like this and draw only coarse, only coarse and very bright coarse, and my mitotic cell is very, very, very strongly positive, this becomes centromere pattern. This becomes DFS pattern. Correct, it's a little bit above your level, but this is what is asked for your exam. So that's the only reason we're discussing this. So this is DFS pattern. This is crest pattern. Centromere pattern is seen with crest syndrome. Centromere pattern is seen with crest syndrome. Now let us just quickly look into the other two types. What do you comment on this? In this, if you look at the mitotic cell, the mitotic cell is not to be seen. The mitotic cell is not stained. So here you can see a mitotic cell strongly stained. Here also you can see mitotic cell strongly stained. Here you see that the mitotic cell is not stained. And you are having only fine, fine, fine speckles. Fine, fine, fine speckles. So, only seeing fine, fine, fine speckles, mitotic cell not stained, is called the fine speckled pattern. Fine speckled pattern. Fine speckled pattern, we get it in SSA, SSB, that is in Jogre. Anti row, anti law, that is where you get fine speckled pattern. Lastly, this one. This is exactly like your centromere, but mitotic cell is not stained. So, mitotic cell not stained. So, when mitotic cell is not stained, you call it as the coarse speckled pattern. So, you call it as the coarse speckled pattern. Hope things are clear now. Okay. Once again, revising. Please at least study this much for your exam and go. And let's try to see the question. Even if you study this much, theory questions you will get. If you identify or not, it's not possible to say. First one is homogeneous pattern. Correct. Second one is DFS pattern, dense fine speckled pattern. Third one is centromere pattern. Fourth one is fine speckled pattern. Fourth one is coarse speckled. Sorry, fifth one is coarse speckled pattern. So, five I have actually put up. I thought of teaching four. Okay, five. Homogeneous pattern. Let us study theory points asked for the exam. SLE. Okay. Inside that, DSDNA can have homogeneous pattern. Drug induced SLE, histone antibody can also have homogeneous pattern. That is what has been asked for the exam. Try to keep JIA also in mind. Not asked. DFS pattern rolls out a CTD. Rolls out a CTD. Syndromere pattern is equal to Crest syndrome. Syndromere pattern is equal to Crest syndrome. Fine speckled pattern is equal to Jogren, anti-SSA, anti-SSB. Okay. Coarse speckled pattern can be associated with anti-Smith antibody, which you see in SLE, can be associated with anti-U1 RNP antibody, which you see in MCTD. So many are there, but at least these two. So anti-Smith, anti-U1 RNP. Correct. Yes. Homogeneous pattern you identify by homogeneous stain. Correct full homogeneously stained, right? And the mitotic cell is strongly positive. So, full homogeneous staining, mitotic cell is strongly positive. DFS pattern is more of a dull pattern, okay? Dull pattern where you are having speckles of different shapes and size, different shapes and size, but mitotic cell is strongly positive. Mitotic cell is strongly positive. Syndromere pattern is where you are having coarse speckles, very bright coarse speckles, okay, very bright coarse speckles and your mitotic cell is again very strongly positive. 
correct fine speckled pattern means you are having fine 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 speckles okay fine 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 speckles and mitotic cell is not positive mitotic cell there is no stain coarse speckled means just like centromere you are having coarse speckles like this but again mitotic cell is not positive so this is how you identify so these are the five patterns once again showing you the first pattern what is this homogeneous staining mitotic cell is positive so it is homogeneous pattern second one dull staining different different heterogeneity with mitotic cells positive so this is called dfs pattern this is very bright staining with mitotic cell also positive it's called zipper pattern this is centromere pattern otherwise even called as the zipper the zipper pattern then you have fine staining but mitotic cell not to be seen so this is fine speckled this is coarse staining but again mitotic cell not to be seen so it is coarse speckled now let us see what was the question asked for the exam the question asked for the exam was this one so here a strong mitotic staining is there very bright speckles are there so this is almost like coarse staining with mitotic cell also positive so it is anti centromere centromeric pattern please don't come and hit me this is a question asked for the exam that's why i'm teaching you i have not bothered to teach you this before elamam has also not bothered to teach you this before it's not practical to actually be teaching at that level and then people coming and saying that we are teaching this teaching that you're teaching this level that level just because a question was asked i'm telling you this even if you don't study this it is okay at least study the theory part of it homogeneous sle drug induced sle Dif diffuse means sorry, dense fine speckle rules out ctd fine speckle jogren coarse speckle unrnp very important and anti smith also centromeric pattern crest okay that is question number two we go to question number three question number three is actually easy question number three is not that very tough at least if you know the basics you will be able to answer this with the lack of cd40 in b cells which immunological abnormality do you expect to see so this is very basic right what have we discussed there is something called cd40 like and cd40 interaction always t cells are activated first t cells go and secondarily activate b cells whenever t cells secondarily activate b cells this interaction is very very important what is this interaction called cd40 ligand cd40 interaction cd40 ligand is seen on the surface of the t cell cd40 is actually seen on the surface of the b cell cd40 ligand on the t cell cd40 on the b cell cd40 can be also seen on the surface of the antigen resonating cell through the cd40 ligand cd40 interaction the t cell secondarily goes and activates the b cell so t cell goes and secondarily activates the b cell with the cd40 ligand cd40 interaction which everybody knows now suppose you are having a defect in the cd40 ligand or you are having a defect in the cd40 then the immunology syndrome that you get is called hyper igm syndrome so immunology syndrome that you get when you are having a cd40 ligand or a cd40 defect is called hyper igm syndrome hyper igm syndrome is of so many types you can see here what we are studying for the exam is most common is type 1 hyper igm syndrome and this most common type 1 hyper igm syndrome is due to a cd40 ligand defect so this type 1 hyper igm syndrome is associated with the cd40 ligand defect what do you require cd40 ligand for it is required for apc t cell interaction it is required for t cell b cell interaction for both it is required when you are having a cd40 ligand defect what are the two issues that will happen when you are having a cd40 ligand defect as has been taught in class there will be a defect in class switch recombination what we call csr so there will be a defect in class switch recombination there will be a defect in somatic hypermutation so you'll be having a defect in class switch recombination you'll be having a defect in somatic hypermutation when you are having a defect in class switch recombination or somatic hypermutation what will happen you'll be having enough and more of igm igm will be increased or normal but igg iga ige all these things will be actually decreased so you'll be having actually speaking a kind of agama globulinemia because gae everything is low but igm alone will be increased this is classical of which syndrome this is classical of the syndrome called hyper igm syndrome what is the reason for hyper igm syndrome so many reasons can be there cd40 ligand cd40 defect etc etc most important is cd40 ligand actions okay now let us come back to this so i think it's very very clear what does this identify with so you are having igg iga IgE all these things reduced and what alone will be high IgM alone will be high okay because of this what can you actually get you get all sort of infections okay classically you get CMV infections PCP infections toxoplasma infections okay because this IgM is high there can be immune mediated hemolytic anemia because of IgM immune mediated hemolysis okay 
this is how it is so generally they have an uncomplicated course but the point is that they may actually go on and develop inventions clear so now let's come back to the question and see what they are asking for lack of cd14 b cells leads to what nk cells have nothing to do with this neutrophils have nothing to do with this this is decrease in igg and an increase in igm this is called witt syndrome this is called a famous hyper igm syndrome it's an easy question if you've studied hyper igm syndrome under primary immunodeficiencies there is nothing to worry about okay specific syndromes that we often discuss in a lot of detail including x-linked gamma globulinemia common variable immunodeficiency as well as hyper igm syndrome so if you if you know that that's perfect correct so that's it and please please keep in mind the clear points of difference between x-linked gamma globulinemia and hyper igm syndrome okay hyper igm syndrome it's almost actually very similar the key point of difference is that this is somewhere between six months to one year hyper igm syndrome is somewhere between one year to two year okay that is the most important thing and in hyper igm syndrome there is almost like a small tonsil okay small tonsil whereas in x-linked agama global anemia there is almost like a absent lymph node bar tonsil okay here igm will be decreased here igm will be increased okay complete agama global anemia will not be seen here because igm is on the higher side so cd19 cd3 and all if you try to put it will be full okay there also cd3 will be okay because it is t cell normal only b cell defect but these are the classical differences and the defect most common here is b cell tyrosine kinase defect which is x-linked most often here also most often it is cd40 ligand which is x-linked but other causes can also be there okay so that's why i'm saying mode of inheritance most commonly is x-linked that's all this is question number three we go to question number four a four-year-old boy presented with history of fever conjunctival congestion erythematous desquamation of the thing, skin 2d echo shows aortic aneurysm and all that so it's actually speaking conjunctivitis image strawberry tongue image desquamation of fingers image everything was given so anybody and everybody who has seen this question would know that it is a kawasaki so anybody and everybody who has seen this question would know it is a kawasaki and how to treat kawasaki has been actually mentioned so many times from my own slide this is a statement treatment with ivig in the acute phase reduces the risk of coronary events from 25 percent to 2 percent so it is so so very pivotal to treat with ivig the point is inside 10 days you should be able to teach treat to get the best results the problem is you think of kawasaki what is mandatory to think of kawasaki fever fever should last for minimum four days or more than four days to actually get think of kawasaki along with fever you think of kawasaki when you are having any out of any any one out of those conditions like conjunctival condition cervical adenopathy oropharyngeal changes edema erythema of the oropharynx or edema erythema of the hand periangal desquamation so many things are there which we have discussed as a criteria but whatever said and done inside 10 days we should be able to administer first dose of ivig which is in fact the only dose of ivig we are giving the dose is 2 gram per kilogram infusion run over 10 hours single dose 2 gram per kilogram over 10 hours some of the pediatricians give it as 1 gram per kilogram today and 1 gram per kilogram tomorrow but as per the guidelines it is 2 gram per kilogram single dose so they have they have not asked anything like that they have asked a very simple question to identify kawasaki how do you treat it with you identify kawasaki you treat it with ivh so after two tough questions we are having two easy questions so again you can see most of the people who have studied would answer questions number three and four people who have studied also may not answer questions number one and two. if you're a little smart you can answer question number one question number two is definitely very difficult to answer that is how the pattern is so those tough questions really don't matter for you as long as you're able to answer those questions which are built on these kind of fundamental concepts as long as you answer these you are very much on course okay in which of the following conditions is vaccination not indicated so we are having digorge here we are having biscot aldrich here we are having ataxia t here we are having complement deficiency here this is a very basic common sense immunology question very basic common sense immunology question wherein you know that we have fundamentally b cell immunodeficiencies we have t cell immunodeficiencies we have combined b plus t immunodeficiencies and then we are having few small 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 things in all these things you know that there is complete contraindication just to show you the specific recommendations for immunization b defects t defects you look at b defects and t defects and you look at what is contraindicated you can actually see in t defects any live vaccine completely contraindicated okay any live vaccine completely contraindicated and all vaccines are probably considered to be ineffective whereas if you look at somebody who has got a b lymphocyte proper defect 
effectiveness of the vaccine is uncertain so uncertain effectiveness and contraindicated vaccines again include most of the live vaccines like opv chicken pox vaccine yellow fever vaccine mmr vaccine all these things so as far as immunodeficiencies are concerned t cell immunodeficiencies you don't want to actually even think of any vaccination b cell immunodeficiencies also the big ones like cvid excelling dagabanglumia you don't actually think of any vaccination in the milder ones like a uh, selective ig deficiency etc uh, we think that probably vaccines are effective that is all if you look at this question, Digeorge is T, Ataxia is T, Discord Altex is also T. And what remains? Complement deficiencies. So please keep in mind, see, complement deficiencies, phagocytic function defects are conditions where vaccines are routinely effective. Okay, and phagocytic function defects also, inactivated vaccines are safe, live vaccines are also probably safe. So what is that we teach in pediatrics and in immunology, what we teach? B cell defects and T cell defects, which are the major primary immunodeficiencies, you basically don't want to get, don't want them to get vaccinated. T cell, absolutely not. B cell, selective IgA deficiency, which is the most common one, which is asymptomatic most of the time, you can consider, but otherwise not. Uh, as far as complement deficiencies are concerned, we can see all routine vaccines are effective. And phagocytic defects also, almost all the vaccines are effective. Okay, so basically that's it. Now, if you actually want to put it out, we have T cell defects, right? T cell defects are mostly combined defects. And in that combined defects, we have skid, we have viscot Aldrich syndrome, we have Digeorge, we have ataxia T-lingitis and all these things. In all these things, there is complete contraindication. B cell defects, when you see the major two B cell defects are your X-linked gamma global anemia and your common variable immunodeficiency, where also we don't give. Asymptomatic B cell defects like a selective IgA deficiency, you may actually be able to give the vaccine. Correct. As far as complement deficiencies are concerned, you can very easily give the vaccine. As far as your phagocytic defects and leukocyte addition deficiency and all these are concerned, there also you can give the vaccine. Okay, I have not taught this in class. Uh, Singaram, I think, has hinted on this in one of his videos. But again, if you if you are having that idea or understanding about immunodeficiency, you've seen a couple of cases. You've at least seen one child with this, and you should be able to understand. This is a question which is mostly trying to test your hospital sense rather than anything else. So, in that case, if you're vaccinated, if you've seen a child coming like this, and you're sitting in the vaccine clinic, and then you are having a doubt, and you ask your pediatric resident about this, that is how you come to know about this more than reading from the book. So, the only place where it is not contraindicated is four. Although it's a tough question, I would definitely consider it as a very standard question. I want everybody to know this because we are seeing children in our vaccine clinic. Vaccine clinic is run by intern. So intern has to know whom to vaccinate and whom not to vaccinate. When a child with a PID comes, primary immunodeficiency comes, whether to vaccinate the child or not, intern has to be knowing. When the intern doesn't know, they have the responsibility to go and ask their PG in pediatrics who will be able to tell him this. That is the base of this question. Okay, so we go to another match the following question. So this is this time very easy. Kaplan syndrome is the reason why I included it under rheumatology because we are having rheumatoid arthritis with cold worker pneumoconiosis that is Kaplan. Sarcoidosis and crazy payment pattern is something that we have seen a lot of times. This is crazy payment pattern where we are having GGO with septal thickening, correct? GGO with septal thickening is what we call as crazy payment pattern. When you hear the word crazy payment pattern itself, sarcoidosis has to come to your mind. Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis where you get crazy payment pattern. You get it in bronchiolar alveolar carcinoma, correct, where you get crazy payment pattern. So, there are so many causes, but as far as the exam goes, these are the three causes which they often, often highlight and ask for the exam. Even in pneumocystis, carnia pneumonia, ARDS, and all we can get this. But these are the three questions. So, here again, it's actually speaking easy, sarcoid and crazy payment pattern. Asbestosis involves the lower lobe. Yes, mesothelioma, there is pleural effusion, so very easy. Asbestosis definitely does involve the lower lobe. All our connective tissue diseases also involve the lower lobe. Keep in mind that ankylosing spondylitis and sarcoidosis are the two conditions which specifically involve the upper lobe. That's why they often ask this. Upper lobe means it is always ankylosing spondylitis and sarcoidosis. Everything else involves the lower lobe. And the other conditions which involve the upper lobe include ABPA, which can involve the upper lobe, hypersensitivity pneumonitis okay or what we call as hsp in the lung is also upper lobe involvement langerhans cell histiocytosis is upper lobe involvement silicosis is upper lobe involvement beryliosis is upper lobe involvement so silicosis beryliosis langerhans cell histiocytosis hsp abpa tb is upper lobe involvement ankylosing spondylitis sarcoidosis is upper lobe involvement so these are all upper lobe involvement even radiation induced lung disease is also upper lobe involvement but 
the others are lower lobe so it's very very important to keep this in mind and as far as ctds are concerned always the most common pattern of ctd ild that you get in ctd is nsip pattern nsip pattern and nsip pattern is characterized by ggo 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 ground glass specifications the only condition where you get uip pattern is rheumatoid arthritis which is characterized by honeycombing cystic changes and destruction of the lung on the whole traction bronchitis okay traction bronchitis destruction of the lung honeycombing cystic changes that is uip uip pattern is seen only with ra okay there is a specific pattern which you get in jogren that is called lip pattern in jogren but although you get lip in jogren commonest pattern in jogren is nsip itself specific pattern that you get in jogren is lip jogren and hiv you get the specific pattern that is lip lip is lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia which is characterized by ggos nodules and cysts in the lungs so that's what is lip pattern which again we have discussed okay so i think that is very clear can you get an obstructive pattern in any of the ctds is another question that you has been asked obstructive pattern has been associated with polymyositis dermatomyositis there you can sometimes get an obstructive pattern which is also called a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia that they have not asked but obstructive pattern have you seen somewhere in ctd I means yes you see that in polymyositis dermatomyositis okay so that's it and one more question where do you get a small airway involvement or a small airway disease small airway disease may be seen with sarcoidosis so small airway disease may be seen with sarcoidosis obstruction in the lung can be actually seen with pmdm more commonly uip seen with ra lip seen with jogren everywhere it is uh, nsip everywhere it is lower lobe ankylosing spondylitis and your sarcoidosis you are having upper lobe okay so that was rheumatology for this exam so it was like this question is a very easy question uh, the other out of the six questions that we have discussed i feel um, um, three questions are easy three questions are tough of which the pattern question is very tough uh, the clinical question on pmscl is moderate if a clinical level you have understanding you can primary immunodeficiency question based on vaccination is purely a hospital based question we go to cardiology which was very easy this time so this time they made rheumatology very tough and they made cardiology very easy so cardiology questions are just like nuts we can answer that which phase of the cardiac cycle do you get aortic regurgitation so this is a early diastolic murmur which we've discussed some people felt that there was isovolumetric relaxation so isovolumetric relaxation is when you start getting the ar murmur but if diastole is already there in the option then there is nothing to discuss with respect to that you know that there are five parts to our diastole three parts to our systole so we have isovolumetric contraction rapid ejection and reduced ejection which are the three parts to our systole and we have five parts to diastole what are the five parts to diastole proto diastole is the first part then we have isovolumetric relaxation then we have rapid filling we have reduced filling and then we have atrial systole these are the five parts to our diastole so this 0.3 seconds is our systole and this 0.5 seconds is our diastole what we mean is ventricular here total duration 0.8 seconds proto diastole we don't include because that is based on hangout interval and i've told you what is hangout interval the actual closure and the point of pressure difference is not the same so when there is a point of pressure difference you don't think that the valve closes after the point of pressure difference there is a gap after which the valve closes that gap is called hangout interval after which you are having isovolumetric relaxation at the end of isovolumetric relaxation is when the valve starts to sorry that is when the ventricle starts to fill this is called rapid filling and it is at that point that you start to see all these issues and these issues primarily with respect to aortic regurgitation that is why you have this early diastolic murmur and all in aortic regurgitation we we'll discussed that in detail acute ar we have discussed ar we have discussed and i have told you please please have everything at your fingertips as far as asar and msmr is concerned because like you can get questions left right and center i have discussed about all these formulation combinations when you get s3 where you get s4 where you get soft s1 in ar and all that has been discussed so it's very very important and as far as this question is concerned it's diastole now torsary point is ecg i think again i'm not wasting time discussing so much it's a very classical ecg you know about this torsary point is the uh, inherited varieties of with the long qts the acquired cause of torsary point is hypokalemia hypomagnesemia and the what to look out for the fact that torsary point is patients are extremely unstable so medical management doesn't make much of a sense torsary point is has to be cardioverted most of the time and all that we have discussed it's also very easy question none of the students i think missed out on this cardiology was extremely easy this time 
this is a question which is set some people disturbed okay but people who did not know anything actually got this question correct what is subclinical myocarditis okay this is again a hospital based question because nobody has taught you what is subclinical myocarditis even cardiology dm lectures also nobody would teach you what is subclinical myocarditis subclinical myocarditis is just an entity that we started using when we when we started treating patients with covid when covid myocarditis was very common so we made these three terms one is called possible uh, subclinical myocarditis then we have probable clinical acute myocarditis and then we have definitive myocarditis so possible subclinical myocarditis probable acute clinical myocarditis and uh, definitive myocarditis definitive myocarditis requires a histology biopsy confirmation so that is what it is so histological confirmation which is not possible so nobody looks for that we are bo bothered about only clinical acute myocarditis and subclinical myocarditis the only difference between clinical acute myocarditis and subclinical myocarditis is that clinical acute myocarditis has symptoms whereas uh, subclinical myocarditis does not have symptoms so the moment you have symptoms you call it as clinical myocarditis if you don't have symptoms you call it as subclinical myocarditis so in this question the only symptom that is mentioned is palpitation so when you are having palpitation then you can't actually be talking about subclinical myocarditis when you have palpitation then it becomes a clinical myocarditis clear that is something which I think has been taught to you if you have managed some COVID patient during your third year, fourth year, final year, you will definitely know this. Because COVID is the center, COVID is, that is the reason they are asking you this. It's not like a high funda question. It is just to test out whether you have some exposure to treating COVID, nothing else. What else is there? Now, apart from that, biomarkers, ECG, ECHO or MRI. Okay, ECG. ECHO or MRI. So, biomarker is correct, ECG is correct, ECHO is correct, MRI is correct. And when you are having a clinical symptom plus this, then it becomes clinical myocarditis. If you don't have a clinical symptom, you are having at least one out of the three. Biomarker can be a drop by ECG finding suggestive of a cardiac injury and then you are having abnormal cardiac function on echo which can be systolic or diastolic dysfunction with a regional wall motion abnormality. Mostly systolic dysfunction with regional wall motion abnormality. All the other options are actually speaking correct. Okay, only thing that is wrong is palpitation. So again, I would definitely not call it as a tough question. Trying to test whether you have gone to the hospital during COVID times. So there is no harm in testing like that. So whatever we study, they will always at INI ask you questions which are testing your hospital sense. Suppose we were not able to go to the hospital and because of that we don't know that you just take it as a part of the game. Don't have to be bothered about that. And at least make a very strong resolution within yourself. The next time at least they'll go to a college where there are enough number of cases. Superior to inferior left side chest wall. Again, testing whether you've gone to the clinics. It's a very simple question. Left side chest wall means we are having the second space that is pulmonary area. Third space, which we call as neo aortic area, or you can even call it as A2. Some people call it neo aortic area, some people call it as herbs point, etc. Fourth intercostal space where you are having the tricuspid area. Fifth intercostal space where you are having the mitral area, but that is slightly lateral. So 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, P, 3, A, 4, T and 5M. This is basic, I mean, second year MBBS level question. And so, the answer to that is P, A, T, M. So, if T was not there, then P, A, and M. Okay. So, you have no rights to complain that somebody has not taught you this. If you complain that you have not been taught this in an app, on an app means, then I think the first place should be going to your dean's office and asking him not be taught this in college. Okay. So, that's how it is. Then we come to this question number five. Question number five is a biochemistry cardiac cardiology question. But uh, Rebecca Madam has taught this very specifically in our lectures. We have also mentioned this. Uh, this is a cardiomyopathy, and they have actually given the name also Bath syndrome. What is the defect in Bath syndrome? Simple question. The defect in Bath syndrome I have actually taught you is the Tafazin defect. Okay, it's actually a Tafazin defect. We have taught about cardiology, dilated cardiomyopathy, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy, what have I said, almost 30% of them, we don't even know the defects. There are so many, many, many gene defects, starting from your uh, myosin defect, there are so many, many defects. Out of that, one defect is Staphazin mutation. This Staphazin defect is due to this gene called TAZ gene. This TAZ gene mutation is called as Barth syndrome, okay. Bath syndrome and this TAZ gene or tafazin is required for cardiolipin modification. So that's why cardiolipin is also correct answer. It is an X-linked disease and it is 3 methyl glutaric aciduria type 2. Okay, 3 methyl glutaric aciduria type 2 and this Bath is actually required for 
cardiolipin modification so that's why in this case the answer is cardiolipin and bath syndrome is related to cardiolipin has been taught in biochemistry so that way you can answer that like pombis disease and acid maltase defect that was also asked so, so two cardiology related biochemistry questions where you can dilate a cardiomyopathy neutropenia three methyl glutaric aciduria with myopathy growth failure so dilate a cardiomyopathy with three methyl glutaric aciduria tafasin gene mutation with cardiolipin modification is basically this so cardiolipin is actually stabilized by tafasin and cardiolipin is required for mitochondrial energy production and mitochondrial protein transport linkage question but i think most of the students have got it right in pediatrics also have been taught this pompey and this that is about cardiology so including pompey also we have six questions in cardiology every question in cardiology was easy some people got this question wrong subclinical myocarditis but you take it in a positive way just means that you have not gone there not understood nothing wrong on your side and this is something which is um, Again, a second year MBBS based question, which I think many people got right. Okay, let us look going to nephrology now. Nephrology questions this time around were also very, very simple apart from one or two questions. They've asked you to calculate the anion gap. So, sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate is basically what we call as your serum anion gap. Potassium is not included. It is sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate that you actually take 145 minus 90 plus 20. So, it is 145 minus 110. 145 minus 110 comes to 35. So, that is your answer here. Okay. Please don't confuse this with urine anion gap where specific values are not there. Generally, it is slightly negative and whenever it becomes positive, then you start thinking about RTA. Urine anion gap is equal to urine sodium plus potassium minus chloride. So, urine sodium plus potassium minus chloride is called urine anion gap. Urine anion gap is checked for only in patients who have normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. In normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, if the urine anion gap is negative, that means it is normal and it is negative, then it is supposedly because of GI causes. And if urine anion gap becomes positive, then you know that it is equal to RT, renal tubular acidosis. That is the value of urine anion gap. Okay, so please study this. This is your serum anion gap and urine anion gap okay that's it simple question question number two a patient presents with vomiting diarrhea has orthostatic hypotension okay whenever you lose fluid automatically who is getting activated you are having ras activation because the most important stimulus for any to be produced is a defective intravascular volume whenever there is a depleted intravascular volume you are having defective reduced or defective or reduced renal perfusion pressure Renin is produced, angiotensin is produced, aldosterone is produced. What does aldosterone do? Aldosterone is responsible for salt and water reabsorption, not just salt or not just water. That is the difference between aldosterone and ADH. ADH is pure water, this is salt and water. When you are having salt and water reabsorption, who is getting excreted? Potassium and your H plus is getting excreted. And as a result of that, you will be having alkalosis, you will be having hypokalemia. So, hypokalemia, alkalosis. So, vomiting and diarrhea related hypovolemia, hyponatremia, hypochloremia, alkalosis. And whenever you are having metabolic alkalosis, the conversation should be respiratory acidosis and not alkalosis. So, naturally, if you know that much, you can answer this. You can take this question to be very complicated and make it more complex and say about the permutation combinations with respect to compensation, etc. But that's not required at your level. This is in very, very simple terms called contraction alkalosis. Whenever you are having volume contraction, the body goes for metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so that's it. Question number three. Question number three was supposedly a, a tough question for some of the students, but somebody who has done this internship should be knowing that a person who is posted for a kidney biopsy has to be observed for 24 hours. This is perfect. Anybody who has done his internship in any standard college where kidney biopsy is being done, what is the role of the house surgeon before a kidney biopsy to do PT, APT, INR, check for HPC, HIV, HCV, to get all the set ready to buy the biopsy gun, to ship the patient to the ICU. That is what the house surgeon does. Once the patient is in the ICU and once the procedure is done, then the responsibility of the house surgeon is to stay in the ICU, see for whether the patient has passed his urine. Till the patient passes his urine, which is going to be for the first time, slightly reddish tinged, and then of course the color is going to get better. When he passes his urine the first time, even it is slightly reddish tinged, then you can actually so first you do it in the prone position then you put the patient in supine position collect his first urine and see if it's perfectly fine shift him to the ward when he's in the ward the responsibility is to keep monitoring his bp and look for any dip in hemoglobin check for hemoglobin in the evening monitor the bp look for his pulse and see for whether he's stable 24 hours after doing renal biopsy you can ask the patient to become mobile and shift him out of the ward this a patient should be observed for 24 hours following a biopsy is a perfectly perfectly true statement 
dark red clots in the urine following biopsy may indicate a hematoma. So, the major complication that you expect following a biopsy is a hematoma formation, which is generally not seen these days because most of the time people are going live. Many of the times we are not going live also. So, you may get a hematoma. So, the patient having dark clots, it is very normal to have slight reddish tinge to your urine following a biopsy, which clears off, clears off, clears off. When you are having frank hematory or clots coming in your urine, then of course you have to be calling the radiologist, you have to be calling the urologist and sometimes the bleeding may not stop, may not stop and may end up even with the renal artery embolization. So that is there. So this is also a right statement. Patient with features of systemic amyloidosis and renal involvement should undergo renal biopsy. Now to make a diagnosis of amyloidosis, we need not require renal biopsy. Patient who was actually uh, having amyloidosis can be diagnosed very easily by rectal biopsy or by abdominal pad of fat biopsy. So, if the patient is not actually very keen, you need not actually do a renal biopsy to establish a diagnosis of amyloidosis. I don't know the exact statement. We can do because many times what happens is these AA amyloid patients and all secondary amyloidosis I'm talking of, they come with nephrotic syndrome too. So, when they come with nephrotic syndrome, how do we know that it is amyloidosis? We don't know whether it is amyloidosis. We do biopsy and biopsy when the pathologist actually causes and says that Congo red is positive, you are having misangial nodularity and stuff and you are having amyloidosis. Then you okay agree with them. Right. It's not like you know it's amyloid. If you are having features of primary amyloidosis and you are having features of autonomic involvement, you are having hepatomegaly, you are having other features like macroglossia, all those things and somebody as a rheumatologist is seeing the patient and is doing a rectal biopsy with the help of the surgeon or abdominal pad of biopsy which rheumatologists do themselves and they find out bio, they find out amyloid and the patient has a renal involvement, there is no reason for you to do a renal biopsy because the diagnosis is already there which I have told so many times. So, should undergo renal biopsy? I am not very convinced. You need not undergo. Okay. FSGS is not diagnosed by percutaneous renal biopsy. FSGS is something which the very name is suggestive of what? Focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis. Which means what? Whenever you use this term, it's a histological term, right? In medicine, as such in nephrology, what do you say? Focal is always compared with diffuse. Segmental is always compared with global. And you have the finding then. What is the meaning of focal? Less than 50% of glomerular involved. What is diffuse? More than 50% of glomerular involved. What is segmental? Inside that glomerulus patchy involvement. What is the meaning of global? Inside that glomerulus full involvement. So when you say focal segmental glomerulus sclerosis, it means less than 50% of the glomerulus are involved. Inside those glomerulus that are involved, there is no complete involvement. There is only patchy involvement. And that patchy involvement here is a eosinophilic hyaline material, which is sclerosis. So focally and segmentally glomerulus have gone for sclerosis. Focally and segmentally glomerulus going for sclerosis is called focal segmental glomerulus close. How can you identify that? Only biopsy you can identify that. The biopsy that we are doing these days is percutaneous biopsy. Are we opening the kidney and seeing? No, it's percutaneous biopsy. For FSGS, you need a few medullary cores, but that is again PG level. I have not asked that. Uh, very superficial core from the cortex may not help you identify FSGS. You may need corticomedullary cores. So, that is of course there, but otherwise routine biopsy, you can very easily identify FSGS. Simple PA staining, you can actually see for this. Even HND, you can identify. So, there is nothing about it. So, FSGS is not diagnosed is wrong. Should undergo biopsy is also wrong. The other two are true. So, not correct means A and D are not correct. Again, I don't think there is anything tough about this question. Now, on the day of the exam itself, evening, so many people actually message me this question, ask me what to do, how to answer, how to answer, how to answer. I would say that even if you have not gone to the hospital also, you can answer this. But the second statement is something which is, I think, more or less hospital based. Okay. On long term hemodialysis due to renal failure, what amyloidosis you get? I think everybody has answered this. A beta to microglobulin associated amyloidosis, which we've discussed so many, so many times. And Ilama, everybody keeps teaching you this. This is just because of the reason that we are having this flux issue, correct? Flux in the dialyzer. And also we have something called efficiency in a dialyzer. So flux is actually almost equal to your pore size. So whatever you do, uh, you cannot actually filter a molecule which is more than the pore size, correct? So, we are now having high flux dialysis where the pore size is more. This is something which we tend to talk about in terms of KUF. Okay. And efficiency is something that we tend to talk of with respect to KOA. So, KUF is actually your flux or pore size. So, when water moves from one compartment to the other, that is by your ultrafiltration or convection, water will drag with it all the solutes which are of a size less than the pore size. 
but how much ever it drags it cannot drag a molecule which size is more than the pore size and this molecule is a beta to microcoli this molecule was because now we are having high flux dialysis older times we had low flux dialysis only and they were basically having a pore size which was um, more less than that of a beta to microglobin so whatever you do a beta to microglobulin cannot be actually filtered this is what we call as a middle molecule and i have discussed about the concept of middle molecules in our uh, video on dialysis in our module on dialysis and uh, this is something which even been taught in pathology also so the patient can have a lot of joint involvement and stuff so the rule was anybody who gets dialyzed for more than 10 years will have a beta to microbial associated amyloidosis but nowadays we don't see that very often even if you don't know any of these things still you can answer that question total plasma exchange is done in ttp this is a question which again many people messaged me saying that this is also slightly tough question i have absolutely i'm not in sync with you it's a very easy question what is there to answer about this what have we studied about ttp ttp and hus are coming under this window of what we call tma okay whenever you think of tma ttp and hus come to your mind they are characterized by two common features what are the two common features microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with thrombocytopenia this is occurring due to a small vessel endothelial injury correct it is occurring due to a small vessel endothelial injury uh, mean not be injury can be antibody whatever this results in a clot a small vessel endothelial injury resulting in a thrombus formation which is occurring in the renal side which is occurring in the cns side when it occurs in the renal side it is called hus when it occurs on the cns side it is called ttp that is why hus has more renal manifestation ttp has more cns manifestation this disease called ttp i told you is uh, basically what is the reason for this endothelial thrombus formation is that you are having a defect in this von willebrand factor metalloproteinase this is a big huge multimeric molecule so you have to break it down that is done by von willebrand factor metalloproteinase which is also called as ada mts 13 what we call as adams 13 this defect in adams 13 is the reason why you are having ttp so von willebrand factor metalloproteinase is not there von willebrand factor cannot be broken down so it works like a thrombus more or less so this is called ttp ttp 5 percent 95 percent 95 percent of the time ttp is because of an antibody against von willebrand factor metalloproteinase correct only five percent it is due to a defect or a deficiency of this enzyme correct so 95 percent we are having ttp because we are having an antibody directed against vwf metalloproteinase and the fact that we have to do ttp has to be treated by therapeutic plasma exchange plasma paresis to remove the antibody it's as clear as that even if you don't know anything more about ttp you can still answer the question so what do you do plasma paresis here for it removes the antibodies ADMTS 13 antibodies okay and thereby it increases ADMTS activity see before doing plasma exchange if you work in a hospital you know you check for ADMTS levels after plasma exchange also we check for ADMTS levels so ADMTS levels are less than 12 percent 30 percent at the beginning itself you know that okay these antibodies are directed against them and by the time you do plasma exchange what will happen your ADMTS levels will increase even if you've done not done that if you watch the video you can easily answer okay so this is question number five so basically five questions from nephrology out of these five questions um this is question number three which was on this fsts and stuff and then this question which is question number five were actually considered as the so-called tough questions but i fail to agree with you i agree with you on the fact that rheumatology questions were very tough i understand the fact that even subclinical myocarditis you cannot answer if you have not worked that's okay but uh I mean, renal was very easy so we go to the liver question only single question on the liver and i think i'm fed up of discussing this 10,000 times we've had this discussion so many many times on hepatitis b the profile of a recovered patient is something that they ask all the time okay all the time so somebody who has recovered will be anti hbs positive anti hbc igg positive this is how you know that somebody has recovered this is called recovery profile we have discussed all the permutation combinations so anti hbs is how you know if somebody is only anti hbs positive and he is mostly vaccinated he is vaccinated or has had a very 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 old kind of infection or something so that's it but generally it is vaccinated anti hbc positive anti hbs and anti hbc igg means then you are actually recovered and if you are having only anti hbc igg is mostly equal to chronic yes mostly equal to chronic and in that hbcg will also be positive even if hbcg is negative we can be having chronic hepatitis b with anti hbc igg positivity when you are having a mutation especially serpentine mutation escape mutation like that okay so simple quest now we go to severe covid this is um, actually speaking a wrong question why wrong question means we have different different organizations giving us different different values for severe covid so severe covid based on whose guidelines is the question so that is a basic point because severe covid can be based on our guideline can be based on 
European American Society of Critical Care. So European American Society of Critical Care is what I have followed because that is what I feel is most standard. So European American Society of Critical Care feels that when your saturation at room air is less than 94%, respiratory rate is more than 30 per minute and your infiltrates are more than 50%, you have to call it as severe COVID. This is European American Society of Critical Care. So saturation is less than 94% is equal to severe COVID. So saturation less than 85% is definitely severe COVID. Respiratory rate more than 30 per minute is actually speaking severe COVID. Here more than 24 per minute is written. So this is not correct as per that. Lung infiltrates more than 42% is what they have said. Here more than 50% is what they have said. So this is also not correct. Mean arterial pressure is again not part of your severe COVID criteria. So uh 70 42 24 we can't include it as per the european american society of critical care the only thing that comes under severe covid is this this is also not severe covid this is also not severe covid this is also not severe covid okay but you can't answer that way then what you can think is that these three are at least part of the criteria in some of the criteria some of the european cr criteria some of the south indian criteria which are again hospital based center to center based they have gone for heart rate lung infiltrate and spo2 as the three parameters map has never been looked upon as a parameter because it is not easy to calculate map you can't find out map also we say map is roughly like say 90 percent oxygen saturation is roughly equal to map of 60 millimeters mercury that's how you can say so that way people have marked the answer as map i don't know what they mean out of this question maybe they want to check out that spo2 lung percentage infiltration and respiratory rate is what they you have to be knowing or else they missed out on does not indicate it may be which of the following indicates severe code which of the following indicates severe code means this is correct otherwise i am not sure what the question means so these are the questions just keep happening like that and we basically have to take it in a positive stride that's all this is what is severe covid as per european american society of critical care person comes to the opd with symptoms of not using his left side so this is a routine stuff question no? low anatomy first videos that we have done i made myself very clear on the fact that we have right side of the cortex which controls the left and right representational hemisphere is what it is called so left and right is controlled by your right parietal cortex Whereas your left parietal cortex controls only your right side. So left parietal cortex controls your right side. Right parietal cortex controls your left and right side. That is your representation. Okay. Topographic organization, representational hemisphere. Now, if you are having a left cortex issue, you will never have a problem because your right side parietal cortex controls your left and right side. So there is no issue. But if you have a right side parietal cortex problem, then you will have a left side issue because the left parietal cortex controls only the right side. So right side controls both left and right, left side controls only right. That is the reason why right cortex issue, parietal cortex issue, you'll be having a problem on the left side. This is what is called left-sided hemi neglect. Yes, that's why you don't have any right-sided hemi neglect. We have only left-sided hemi neglect. And left-sided hemi neglect means you're neglecting everything on the left hand side. You're not bothered about the left hand side, you're not shaving on the left hand side, you're not eating from the left side of the plate, you are not actually completing anything, a task given on the left hand side. Classically, the task you can see, right? So, left hand side is not being used. This is called left sided hemi neglect. So, that's why the answer is right to posterior parietal. Non dominant lobe uh, issues that you get because of right cortex involvement are very, very commonly asked, and we have discussed that so many times. What are they? One is construction of apraxia, second is visuospatial disorientation, then dressing apraxia. Yes, construction apraxia, dressing apraxia, visuospatial disorientation, and hemispatial neglect okay and that is severe forms is called anosognosia so construction apraxia visual spatial disorientation dressing apraxia hemispatial neglect they are all seen with non-dominant lobe issues and dominant lobe issue we have seen just pan syndrome parietal lobe so that's something which we've already discussed in detail it's a very simple question neurology was very easy this time which of the following is not a cause for reversible dimension this even from the middle of your sleep you should be able to answer we have discussed this everybody knows this there's nothing much to even be talking about this a degenerative disease that is Lewy body dementia what is important for you is to know what are the causes of reversible dementia whenever you think of reversible dementia drugs of course very very important anticholinergic strangulations and so many things second is depression yes third is vasculitis and sle Four is nutritional, that is B12 or folate. Five is NPH. Six is tumor. Seven is chronic meningitis, bar HIV, bar syphilis. And eight is thyroid issues, both hyper and hyper, hypo and hyper, 
and hypopara. So hypopara, thyroid issues both hyper and hypo, chronic meningitis HIV, tumor, NPH, B12 folate, vasculitis, depression drugs. This is the list and I think all of you will be knowing this list and I think everybody will be familiar with this list. Even if you don't know the list so much, it's very easy question here. Lewy body dementia, MSA, CBD, Parkinson, all that. And we every time have a question on Parkinson and Parkinson related stuff. So please be very clear and study that properly. Neurological test is Babinski. That's a very straightforward, easy question. Just asking you what is Babinski. Please know how to do that because we are planning to pass MBBS, then you have to be knowing that. Okay, we go to the endocrine part. So neurology was actually speaking very easy. So you saw that rheumatology was tough, two, three questions. Cardiology, maybe one or two questions. Nephrology, maybe one question. Till then, everything has been easy. So that's why even if the exam is tough, you still see that somebody who is a topper, field will still be getting somewhere around 165, 170. That's going to be easy for him because of the reason that even if you miss out on those controversial tough questions, they'll still have their basics very strong. So they will answer the questions where you have to be showing your skill. Diabetic patients started on a drug that decreased her HbA1c from 7.6 to 6.7. She started complaining of vulvovaginal pruritus. Yes, so, so, so classical. Whenever you start the patient on STLT2 inhibitors, you tell them like you can have any kind of UTI. Fungal UTIs are most common, but even you can have bacterial UTIs, you can have vulval pruritus, vulvovaginal pruritus, all these things are possible. So, because of which, very simple answer, canagliflozin. There is no doubt, a carbose will not reduce HbA1c, <laughs> then only the issue comes. Linagliptin and all, of course, DPP4 inhibitors have nothing to do with this. Liragluted STLT, I mean, liragluted or GLP1 analogs again have nothing to do with this. Simple question. So next is a clinical question, which is a pneumonia question, which we have always emphasized on the need to know CURB-65 properly and accordingly treat. So here age and all of the patient is not given uh, and even confusion is not given. So let us just try to write the score again, CURB-65. Here BP is again not given, but they have said that the patient is shifted to the ICU. So because the patient is shifted to the ICU, I assume that this is severe pneumonia. I assume it is severe pneumonia. Otherwise, confusion, urea, uh, urea high, respiratory rate more and BP less and 65, that is CURB 65. This is our score as you would know. And in this, there is a small problem. This problem is that national guidelines and international guidelines are little different. If I am seeing a patient, 0 OP, 1 will be IP, 2 onwards will be in the ICU. But internationally, this is not how it is. 0 and 1, they put the patient as OP. 2, they put the patient as IP. 3, also they put the patient as IP. 4, they put the patient in ICU. This is international guidelines. Uh, but I am not agreeing with that. But still, if you get a question for the exam, you write it like this because the question is based on some international guideline, they will be doing like this. But if you have a patient with 3 and you don't put the patient in the ICU tomorrow, you will be in court, okay? Because the bystanders will definitely question. There are so many logistics reasons behind that. So, 0, 1, 2 is what we follow, but this is what a textbook says. But anyway, here it's easy because they have said shifted to the ICU. So, you know that this is a severe one and we have discussed severe without any particular risk factors for MRSA pseudomonas. We are not talking about any MRSA pseudomonas. It is a beta lactam plus macrolide combination. So, beta lactam plus macrolide combination is the combination. Whether it is non-severe or severe, we go with this. But here one more option is there that is beta lactam plus levofloxacin or respiratory quinolone combination is also there. But beta lactam plus macrolide both are equally considered but still I would say beta lactam plus macrolide little bit more better. Okay. That is it. If it is an OP question, then amoxicillin with doxy or azithro. Okay, amoxicillin with doxy or azithro. Oh, that is the best or you can even consider doxy monotherapy, azithro monotherapy, but still this is the best. Here this is the best. So, beta lactam plus macrolide is the best answer. Okay, so septriaxone plus azithromycin is the best answer. Okay, clear. That's a simple question. I don't think there is much of confusion in that. Few more very easy questions from endocrine. Uh, Antidiabetic drug causing a decrease in HbA1c. Okay, so it's a potent drug. Very good. And it's both. It's got action on both pre and post. That's also very good. GLP and GIP and decrease in glucagon. So the only question is whether you want to mark liraglutide or you want to mark alloglyptin because both are related to in that way. Let us see this. Very very simple. What have we taught of? We are talking about incretins. What are incretins? In response to an oral glucose load, they are able to amplify the insulin release from the pancreas. They are called incretins. GLP-1 and GIP are the two most potent incretins in the human body. Of which, what is the ad advantage the GLP-1 has over GIP? The advantage the GLP-1 has over GIP is that it is able to decrease glucagon also. So, it is able to decrease glucagon also. So, if you look at that, GLP-1 will be able to decrease glucagon. So, we are actually giving recombinant GLP-1. That is one option that we are having. Yes, 
or we are having DPP4 inhibitors. DPP4 inhibitors will be able to increase endogenous DLP and GIP and that is one major advantage because if you use endogenous DLP what is the problem it will be easily metabolized by DPP4. So either we can go for recombinant GLP that is one way we can treat or we can go for DPP4 inhibitors. Correct. These are your liraglutide and all those things. This is your gliptins. Okay, so both of them effectively will be able to decrease glucagon. Both of them will be able to increase GLP and GIP, GIP and GLP1 levels and uh, decrease in pre and postprandial glucose. So, if you want to differentiate between the two, it's very easy. GIP has got nothing to do with liraglutide. Liraglutide is a pure GLP analog, so it doesn't increase GIP levels and it is not an oral drug. GLP1 analogs are all sub Q drugs. Now, we are having oral semaglutide that's not there in the options. So, based on this much data, it's very, very clear that here they are asking for an oral drug which is a reasonably potent drug which can increase GLP-1 and GIP levels. What I mean GLP-1 and GIP are endogenous levels. Thus, they can actually produce a reduction in pre and post primary glucose. It's a very clear question. It's a glyph. I don't know if you write the glute, that means your basic understanding is wrong. Okay, so please go back and see that again. CFTR gene chloride, very easy question. Most common cause of adrenal incident loma. This is we have discussed in great detail during our, dis I mean, our discussion. Majority, majority of the time they are non-functioning, non-functioning, non-functioning. You can see this. 90% of the time they are non-functioning. If it is functioning, then it can be a cortisol secreting adenoma. If it is functioning, then it can be a FIO also. Cortisol is slightly more common than FIO. And malignancy is all very, very less here. And what are the indicators of malignancy also we have discussed. So, mostly it's non-functioning. It's an easy question. Which of the following hormone acts via JAK-STAT pathway? Whenever we talk of JAK-STAT pathway, growth hormone, prolactin, which are the twin hormones and EPO, this is what I have discussed. But I have also told you that aldosterone acts via G-protein coupled receptors, vasopressin acts via G-protein coupled receptors, and I have told you that in vasopressin, it's V1, V3 going by IP3, DG, V2 cyclic, MB, calcitonin also acts via G-protein coupled receptors. So that we have discussed. If you know that, you can mark leptin. Specifically leptin, I haven't taught you. Leptin acts via jack star pathway. But if you know that the other three are G-protein coupled, you can mark leptin. So in this group, there is leptin also. So it's slightly higher level question. But if you know the others are wrong, you can eliminate and come to the answer. It's always the key. Most common cause of hypercoagulable state, factor failure and mutation, factor failure and mutation said thousand times, thousand times, thousand times. 60 year old man presenting with lymphadenopathy raised to WBC smart cells. Even last time they have asked the same question. CLL is not a tumor of the marrow. CLL is not a malignancy of the marrow. CLL is a malignancy of the blood. Blood, blood. We have discussed this so many times. So, you don't have to unnecessarily do flow from the marrow itself. We can do flow from the blood. Flow will only actually tell us whether it is CLL properly. Everywhere it is flow that is the king. So, naturally flow cytometry from the peripheral blood and you know how the CLL cells would be. They are CD5 positive. They are CD10 negative. They are CD19, CD20, 21, 22 and 23 also positive so this is how CLL cells would be like and you know that CLL can be from the navy cell and all that we have discussed all those things in detail it's a very simple question and iron deficiency enemy as always reduce serum iron levels correct reduce transferrin levels transferrin is equal to TIBC so you'll be having high transferrin levels increase total iron binding capacity correct reduce ferritin level correct so these three options are correct correct we've seen this so many times right the earliest change would be ferritin will come down so, the body will try to synthesize more transferrin that is called serum transferrin which we can't measure. So, indirectly we are measuring it as TIBC. Serum ion of course the amount of ion bound to transferrin low and serum ion um, low divided by TIBC which is high which means percentage saturation of transferrin will be on the lower side. Okay. This profile and all I think everybody has studied. So, when we have tried to discuss medicine and medicine related questions, at the end what we have understood is that although the although from the outside the paper is being heralded as a really tough paper etc. How many tough questions have we discussed in this? We have maybe I think hardly discussed around 8 tough questions. That's it. Nothing more than that. And even if you get all these 8 questions wrong and you get the so-called tough questions in the other subjects also wrong, still you will be having maximum 25 to 30 questions. Maximum. And out of this, by default, three or four questions you would have got right. So, when you are having 25 questions wrong, still 175 questions are there. So, as long as your basics are strong, as long as you are able to eliminate properly, as long as you are able to keep a cool head and answer with conviction, there is nothing that is preventing you from going ahead in this exam. Okay. So, please don't take it otherwise. 
प्लीज डोंट टेक दैट मच स्ट्रेस इन टू योर सिस्टम ऑल्सो एस आई कीप रिपीटिंग ऑल द टाइम दिस एग्जाम इज नॉट द अल्टीमेट थिंग दिस इज जस्ट नॉट लाइक एन आई एग्जाम वे यू बिकम अ सिविल सर्विस ऑफिसर वन यू पास द एग्जाम इट्स नॉट दैट वे दिस इज एन एग्जाम दिस जस्ट गिविंग यू एन एंट्री टिकट एंट्री टिकट इन टू दिस बिग वर्ल्ड ऑफ मेडिसिन और सर्जरी और गाइनिक और समथिंग सो देर इन यू हैव टू बी यूसिंग योर रिसोर्स वाइसली जस्ट ट्राइंग टू गेट अक्रॉस दैट इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट एंड गेटिंग इन टू अ गुड कॉलेज and that is all that is required so please don't attribute so much of importance you study level headedly and most importantly don't mix up things don't mix up unnecessarily that is the major advice that i want to give you to so sticking to offline please stick to offline if sticking to online stick to online please don't club between online and offline if you're going for a face to face class and then of course you're happy with that face to face class please follow that and whatever videos you have missed you come and watch at the corresponding faculty don't go and attend a face to face class where somebody else is teaching and then come and attend the anatomy class where here reviraj is teaching then trying to answer the question by having watched somebody else's class all this will be total chaos okay so please try to figure out in a very simplistic way as i told you know clinical precision is what is required here you have to be very clinical in your performance and the being clinical in your performance not just meaning that you have to go to the ward clinical is a word which you use otherwise also as i have said that means you have to be very professional so being professional is figuring out what you want to study studying that to perfection having trust and faith in that and looking out for teachers who you are seeing in sync with your basic persona if you like that person's way of talking you like that person's way of delivering out things then please be happy and please uh, get on with that if you're not happy then you go to another person but please don't mix up everything and study okay you study five subjects from this four subjects from that three subjects from here and then you do notes of this and then you follow questions there absolutely not working okay and please don't have this um, bus behind notes and thinking that notes are your savior no ideas ideas our whole subject is about generating ideas generating ideas in front of the patient generating ideas for the student generating ideas when you are faced with an issue generating ideas and those ideas you try to execute that's what basically our subject is about as far as i have understood so that's also important it may be different for another person but as far as i have understood that's what it is so good luck continue preparing and of course you will actually end up where you want to be because this is that kind of a scenario right? where you prepare more and more automatically you will get better and better so good luck and this is about inict may 2023 thank you